2017 Infrastructure Great Report prepared by the American Society of Civil Engineers reports that America's infrastructure, cumulative infrastructure grade average point is D plus. Our drinking water and wastewater infrastructures have received a D and D plus grades, respectively. And our energy infrastructure has received a grade of D plus. To just address or to update our infrastructure needs alone, we will have to invest over a trillion dollars in the next five years. Needless to mention, water and energy are the two most critical and essential commodities for our sustainable development, without which it's almost impossible to imagine a life of comfort and happiness. As we see here, the energy consumption trends change across the regions. It depends on the climatic conditions and the cultures and socioeconomic impacts and everything. While we look at the domestic level, the specific energy consumption per person is about 28.5 kilowatt hours per day, that is, per person. It can vary between 16 and 40 kilowatt hours per day. And where do we use our energy? We use our energy for space heating, lighting and other appliances, and water heating, and refrigeration, and air conditioning. We all pay our utility bills, right? These bills for water, electricity, and waste management, and they run into a couple of hundreds of dollars a month to a couple of thousands of dollars in a year. Depending on where we live, our bills vary. These homes are called homes of consumption. I call them vampire homes because they consume our energy, they consume our water, they consume our food. Food. We consume food, but it turns into waste. They also take our money. Can we convert these homes of con consumption into homes of production where we can produce Water, food, energy, and revenues. And of course, recycling is, has to be the core component of this scheme, new scheme. Now, when we think about this, yes, many of you can think about solar energy option and other water treatment systems, on-site water systems. I agree. We all know what to do. But these systems work in isolation. They do not provide eco-friendly and a comprehensive solution for all water, energy, and food needs at our domestic level. Let's take a look at a housing here where we have to address our energy needs at the domestic level. We said we could use solar energy right? Because sun is the major form of energy on Earth. We could use solar, energy, solar panels to convert the solar energy into electricity, and which could be used for our domestic needs. So if at all, we can convert all of the south-facing roofs of our house with solar panels. The electricity produced through these panels is sufficient to um, meet our needs. At the same time, we can also produce surplus to be fed into grid so that revenues can be generated. So we know that story. We also can estimate how many of the solar panels we would need depending on our needs, and it also depends on the size and the capacity of the solar panels. Now, we talked about solar energies for meeting electricity needs. So that is taken care of. Let's talk about water needs at domestic level. I want to remind you, when we talk about water, it is a must that we have to talk about energy. Water and energy are two in intrinsic commodities. They have an intrinsic connection that one cannot be produced without the other. We cannot produce energy without water we cannot produce water or use water without using energy. 
So let's take an example of wastewater that we produce at the domestic level. We all consume about 100 gallons per day of water that turns out to be wastewater or used water, right? Used water mostly contains carbon and nutrients. They're so-called pollutants. Current wastewater treatment systems are centralized, are based on aerobic treatment technologies, which are energy intensive, meaning that they have a cost and environmental footprint associated with it. They also release large quantities of greenhouse gases. They are unintentional, and therefore US EPA says that those are part of natural cycles in the environment. China, India, and USA are in the top five countries in the world that produce greenhouse gases that come from different sources. If we handle wastewater treatment on site and treat the water to the level that can be reused and recycled safely for our domestic needs, then we could address water issues as well. So how can we do this? Here we're proposing something really transformative, this idea. We would never think about having an anaerobic digester embedded into the wall structures of dwellings. Right? So if you see here, an anaerobic digester can be embedded into the wall structure that would treat or remove most of the carbon from the wastewater, and it produces biogas, right? Biogas is mostly comprised of methane, 60%, and the other 40% is carbon dioxide and other trace gases. Now, we are making an attempt to make convert that energy-intensive process into an energy-producing process by moving from aerobic systems to anaerobic systems here. Now, this biogas that's produced is not suitable, or the quality is not enough to be fed into an energy conversion unit, which is typically a combined heat and power unit that produces electricity and heat simultaneously. So this biogas has to be refined. We propose that we should use microalgae panels, which can be integrated into the home structure again, um, similar to solar panels, so that the biogas produced from anaerobic digesters can be passed through microalgae. And you know that microalgae sequester carbon dioxide. Every pound of biomass, microalgae biomass produced fixes 1.8 pounds of carbon dioxide. That's a good news for us. In this process, microalgae also produce oxygen. So we can convert the biogas that has impurities into the biogas that, that's high purity methane and then oxygen rich biogas to be fed into combined heat and power so that more than 80% efficiency can be achieved in energy conversion process. Having said that, I said in the beginning that we have taken care of energy needs, so whatever the energy we're producing through this anaerobic digester is additional energy. So we're becoming more and more energy positive at domestic level. That means we can make more money out of it. Next, the, the purpose of having microalgae panels is also, it's twofold. One, to refine the biogas, two, to produce additional biomass that can be fed into anaerobic digesters so that biogas production can be enhanced and therefore we can produce more electricity. Now, microalgae removes nutrients from the wastewater. So we said carbon and nutrients are the kind of major pollutants in wastewater. And so we have taken care of carbon in anaerobic digester and nutrients in microalgae panels. This water now then passes through hydroponics systems where you can cultivate edible vegetables such as, such as tomatoes, lettuce, things like that. We all know that these hydroponics work on, they are systems that do not necessarily require soil for their growth and then to produce 
um, fruits and such. And so these plants utilize the nutrients available further in that wastewater, I would call it used water, so that food can be generated. Now this used water has passed through by these three different processes. One is the anaerobic digester and microalgae panels and then hydroponics. That means the water quality is suitable with minimum pretreatment to go into an advanced filtration unit, which could be a membrane unit, followed by disinfection so that we could have, we could safely use this water for domestic needs. By this, we have addressed both energy and water and food. Actually, we have addressed all of the needs at the domestic level. That means decentralization appears to be a solution when we consider this option. So what are the challenges? It looks like very impressive, very promising, very interesting, but do we know everything? Yeah, we know everything. That means we know solar energy, solar panels, we know about microalgae, we know about anaerobic digesters, we know about combined heat and power systems. But individually, when they work in isolation, we do not know how they interact with each other when they are together, combined in a system, in a configuration. That is what the knowledge we need to develop here. So, first of all, we are proposing a dynamic ecosystem where humans are interacting with, um, dealing with their waste, interacting with anaerobic digester where there is anaerobic bacteria, and microalgae systems where we deal with microalgae, hydroponics where we are dealing with plants. This is a very dynamic ecosystem and they're working in isolation, they're not working together. So we need to understand these different units and see how they are interacting with each other and if we can develop a synergy between individual processes so that the benefits can be enhanced. Now, we also do not know much about combined heat and power at the domestic level, at the housing level, single dwelling levels. And integrating these combined heat and power systems in the attic area in the house and integrating solar panels. I said that solar panels can be integrated on the roofs, but they do not necessarily have to look like exhibit pieces. They can be integrated seamlessly and efficiently into the roof structure, like if, they, if you use them in the form of shingles, they're called solar shingles. Technology advances so much that it wouldn't even look like you're using a solar panel for you to support your energy needs. Now that means we also need to understand more about structural engineering and any issues to deal with that. A nutrient removal between microalgae system and a hydroponic system is very important because the Food production capacity of hydroponics depends on how much of nutrients are available to them. And then we will have to worry about water chemistry and the final quality of the water. That is, again, a different area that we need to think about so that the water at the end is safe for consumption. Now, these ideas seem to be like especially consuming our own water, used water, treating, and consuming may seem to be awkward, but there are communities around the world and regions that are already considering because there are no options in those communities. With population growth and economic development, and we need also think transformative in that we look at systems from a different perspective based on scientifically sound principles and technologies that are reliable and sustainable. And when we have understood this integrated system, its feasibility, when we have optimized the system and developed a control and optimization systems, we could develop a human interface that can be user friendly so that it can be adopted easily anywhere in the world, in any community, any housing. However, we may still have to deal with cultural, socioeconomic barriers. We may have to deal with existing regulations and policy updates. We may have to deal with the governance issues. For example, when we bring in these new technologies, 
actually is going to break, bring a good impact, positive impact to the society so that we are bringing local market, local business, to, uh, and we deal with um, domestic individual house levels. There is more employment, local employment and local business and economic development. But however, there is an existing infrastructure based for water, drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment and energy production systems, how they would be impacted, and the other stakeholders' uh, input needs to be considered here before this become a reality. Once we have to address all of these issues, actually, we need to um, adopt an innovative design philosophy. If you're an engineer or designer, you would know what it means by engineering design process. We all know those steps that we need to go through, or it's an iterative process. That means that we have to jump from step one to 10 at any time, or step one to five, or nine to five, four, whenever it requires. But what I'm saying here is that the innovative design philosophy, especially when we are de developing eco-centered systems and sustainable communities and housing, that has to include empathy as its core component. We should be able to, as designers, as engineers, to be able to empathize with our customers and clients, put ourselves in their shoes and be able to ask, what is the most desirable outcome out of this project? Then we can define our problem, define our goals and objectives and performance goals, and brainstorm ideas and come up with as many as ideas, solutions possible, test and develop prototypes, implement, review, and improve, and continue to excel. When all this is done, it is possible to move forward. As we share this concept, I would say this concept is more, both transformative and disruptive. Transformative in the sense that we are thinking beyond the traditional boundaries here. We are taking new challenges. This is the, the paradigm how we're looking at current water, energy, and waste management systems is changing here by the way when we take this approach to deal with them at a domestic level. It is also disruptive in the sense that it can be applied everywhere, anywhere in the world, and local businesses and employment can be um, enhanced, and so there can be um, economic development. Now, always remember that when we have to deal with things, we have to think global, but act local so that we can make meaningful impact. 